Okay, this is going to be nine things to do with your Bible. And I got this wrote out on the website here, hensleybiblebeliever.com under weekly Bible believing messages. So what's nine things to do with your Bible? I'm just going to get right into it. The first one is believe the Bible. If you don't believe the Bible, you're not going to get very, very far. I mean, you could read the Bible a hundred times, study the Bible for a thousand hours, but if you don't believe it, you're not going to accomplish very much. So the first thing you want to do is just believe the Bible. And that's becoming a very rare thing today. Even with most Christians, they, they don't believe the Bible is without error. But 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, For this cause also think we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. So they didn't receive it as the word of men, like many people do. They received it as the word of God. And it effectually worketh in you that believe. So it's hard to rely on something that you don't believe. But you can fall backwards on the Bible. You can believe it. You know how you'd play that game with your friends where you would have them stand behind you and you know, you'd say, I trust you, and you'd fall backwards. That's the way it is with the Bible. You can put your faith in the Bible. You can fall backwards on it. But what do Bible correctors do? They spend their time correcting the Bible, the Bible that should be correcting them. And 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So the Bible should be correcting us, not the other way around. You know, you need to adjust your beliefs to fit the Bible, not the other way around, not adjusting the Bible to fit your beliefs. But I wanted to show you how the average person, the average Christian, feels about the Bible. They don't see it as 100% pure Word of God without error. Look at this quote here. Like just at this website here, gotquestions.org. The question, does the inerrancy of the Bible only apply to the original manuscripts? That is the original copy that, you know, Moses would have written, Paul would have written, any other Bible authors would have written. Look at the answer. It says to be inerrant is to be free from error. But look what they say. Only the original autographs, the original manuscripts written by the apostles, prophets, etc., are under the divine promise of inspiration and inerrancy. That's what they're saying. That's not true. It says the books of the Bible, as they were originally written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, were 100% inerrant, accurate, authoritative, and true. Now look what they say. There is no promise that copies of the original manuscripts would be equally inerrant or free from errors. Look at this. As the Bible has been copied thousands of times over thousands of years, some copious errors have likely occurred. So, the average person, they don't believe that you have a 100% pure, without error, word of God in your lap today. They believe that it was without error in the original piece of paper that it was on, but over through many years of copying the Bible, that there's been copyist errors that have occurred. So they do not believe that they have a pure, 100% without error word of God. But we do, because God did promise to preserve his word. It's not just inspired. Of course he inspired it. And then he preserved it. He's preserved it all the way up until now. And he's clear with that in Psalm chapter 12, 
where he talks about how the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. He says, Thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. So he's still preserving them. You still have a pure 100% word of God that you can go to right now. So just believe the Bible. Don't listen to all these people who say that the Bible's got errors in it. Just believe it. And it's going to effectually work in you. It's going to work in you. All right. Believe the Bible. The next thing is read the Bible. Become a daily Bible reader. Here's a good verse for that. Deuteronomy 17, 18 through 19. It says, And it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom, that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests, the Levites. And it shall be with him, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So, read therein all the days of your life. Isaiah thirty four sixteen. Seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. So, daily Bible reading. And there's more than one way to read the Bible. Start reading the Bible with a question or topic in mind. Write down everything that you come across that pertains to that topic or question. You know, any topic you can think of that you're interested in or a question that you're looking for an answer to. Write that down. And then as you're reading, any time that you come to something that pertains to that question or topic, write it down on that piece of paper. And then when you make it through the entire Bible, you've got a complete thought about what the Bible says about that certain thing. That helps you keep your mind on it. Another thing is pray while you read. Read while you pray. This is like God talking to you as you talk back to him. It's like this. You read a verse, for example. Say I was to read. And it shall be with him, when, and he shall read therein all the days of his life, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God, to keep all the words of this law and these statutes to do them. So I'm reading along my Bible, and I say something like to the Lord, Thank you, God, for giving me the Bible to read therein all the days of my life. And that's like God's talking to you because the Bible is the word of God, and that's how he talks to you. And then you're praying back to him. That's like you talking back to God. You can literally sit and read the Bible and you're having a conversation with God with him talking to you and you talking right back to him because you're praying as you read it. See, that's the way it's supposed to be. He said, seek ye out the book of the Lord and read. Read while you pray, pray while you read. Another thing you can do, obviously, read it straight through with a goal in mind for the year. And you could start now. You don't have to wait till january you could start now and try to read through the whole thing by this time next year do it with the goal in mind you know they say on average it, it might take 72 hours for you to read it and if you think about it that's not that long you do an hour a day it might take you a little over two months but you can become a daily bible reader but first believe the bible don't just see it as the word of men. Don't just see it as something that's got errors in it through years and years of copying. But believe it and then read it. Then the third thing, you can study it. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And you don't want to be a Christian that's ashamed because you haven't studied. You know, if you get out into the work area, you know, at these factories and stuff, you're working with a lot of lost people. And they, honestly, they know a lot of Bible because, you know, nowadays they spend so much time on, like, the internet, looking at conspiracy stuff, looking at TikTok conspiracy stuff, Facebook conspiracy stuff. And they're picking up on a lot of Bible. A lot of times it's not the right thing. It's the wrong thing that they're believing but they've got a lot to talk about because they spend so much time reading that stuff. And if you don't get in the Bible and they're spitting off all this Bible at you, 
They're going to make a fool out of you because you're a Christian and yet they know more Bible than you do. So you need to study to show yourself approved so you don't get ashamed. You need to get familiar with the doctrines of the Bible. If you get familiar with the doctrines of the Bible, it's going to help you so much in your Christian life. And the Bible is clear in 2 Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. What's the first thing it's profitable for? It's profitable for doctrine. More than it's profitable for correction, instruction, and righteousness. Maybe not more than, but that's placed at the beginning of the list here. But what if people mostly use it for? For correction, instruction, and righteousness. They mostly use it for saying, do this and don't do that. But it's profitable for doctrine first. You need to learn the doctrine. The doctrine is your set of beliefs that you have. And you need to get into the doctrine of the Pauline epistles. That would be like Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Now he gives you the primary doctrine for the church today in the Pauline epistles. He gives you the prophecy. He wants you to learn the prophecy of the Bible. You know, the study of the rapture, the time of Jacob's trouble, the second coming, the millennium, eternity. You know, things that haven't even happened yet. You learn the prophecy. You learn the typology. For example, the Old Testament is full of pictures and types of the Lord Jesus Christ. And in every New Testament doctrine is you can find typology of it. For every doctrine in the New Testament, you have an illustration for it in the Old Testament. For everything that you learn about in the New Testament, you can go back there in the Old Testament and find a picture or illustration for it. And you need to study those things. You can also do an overview of the entire Bible. Start in Genesis and go all the way through Revelation. And for each book, find out the main theme. Find out the historical application, the doctrinal application, the inspirational application. This will help you get a general idea of what the Bible is about as a whole. And, you know, like in Acts chapter 7, notice how Stephen basically gave you an overview of the entire Old Testament and laid out what all that was about back there from Genesis to Malachi. And then, you know, at a much slower pace you go verse by verse through the scriptures select a book of the bible and begin to look at each verse one by one examining the key phrases and the key words in each verse by comparing scripture with scripture and first corinthians 2 13 tells you how to study the bible and it says which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth but which the holy ghost teacheth comparing spiritual things with spiritual so you'll take E-Sword, like this right here. You know, I got E-Sword. You can get E-Sword on, on here, on the computer, or on your phone. You can compare Scripture with Scripture. You know, you would come on here, go to the search bar, say you wanted to look up the word study. There you have it. Three verses says the word study and you just compare words you compare key phrases and that's how you learn and you would you know like you could go to second timothy 2 15 and next uh next to you you could write first thessalonians 4 11 or ecclesiastes 12 12 much study is a weariness to the flesh and you, you that's how you learn you just go through it that way and you know there's all types of uh places to go for good study material one of my favorite places to go is goodpreaching.com and then go to the bible study section and they literally have a verse by verse for each book of the bible some of them by multiple teachers here like genesis you got three different ones and it's genesis through revelation on here tons of Bible believing material. It's King James Bible believers here in these lessons. And then you want to, if you want to do an overview of each book of the Bible, I've went through the whole Bible and I've 
showed you my notes for each book of the Bible where I wrote them at the beginning of each of the books of the Bible. I've got Genesis through Revelation on here. See, Genesis through Revelation. And then if you want to take it a step further, I've got an overview for each book of the Bible on here. Starting in Genesis. And then I've got a section or playlist called New Testament Overviews you could go to. And I just I give you an overview of each book of the Bible that way. And that way you get a general understanding of what each book of the Bible is about. So, believe the Bible, read the Bible, study the Bible, and then the next thing, mark up your Bible. And a worn out Bible will keep you from wearing out. The more you're in your Bible, the better off you're going to be. And Jeremiah twenty three eighteen it says, For who hath stood in the counsel of the Lord, who hath perceived and heard his word, who hath marked his word and heard it? Have you spent much time marking up your Bible? In Exodus 7.14, it says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. He said to write something for a memorial. He wanted them to remember that battle that they had with Amalek and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. It's important to mark up and write in your Bible because you'll never remember it all. You'll never remember all that you're learning as you're on this Bible journey. So you want to write it down for a memorial and then rehearse it in your own ears again. If you have references and comments wrote for each verse, you'll always have that quick answer when you turn to a verse. Say that you want to help somebody out and they're, they're asking you a question about a certain verse. All you got to do, get your Bible out, turn to that verse. You've already got the answer. You got the references already laid out. And I'm, I'm telling you, you need to get a wide margin Bible. You hardly ever see anybody with a wide margin King James Bible anymore. But that's what you need. You got to get you a wide margin Bible and <clears throat> begin to mark up and write in the Bible. In Exodus 17, 14 there, Moses was told to write this for a memorial in a book. The Lord didn't want him to forget the, that battle. See, you're going through life and you're listening to preaching sometimes, you're listening to teaching sometimes, and somebody's going to give you a treasure from the Word of God. You want to write down that treasure in your Bible. That way you'll never forget it. You want to underline that treasure. You want to highlight that treasure in the Scriptures. And you don't ever want to forget it. What you want to have is a Bible full of little treasures because it is a treasure trove. And you're constantly forgetting things that you learned, but writing it down in your Bible is like having backup brain storage that you don't have to have it all on your mind at once. And let me show you, I'm just going to show you a good place to get you a good wide margin Bible. Go to purewordsoftruth.com and I think this is the best Bible overall. I've been recommending it to people for a long time. So you even got one that's uh, $81 here. And it's the fourth edition, 2017. And you can go on here and you got a wide margin. The fourth, you got the vinyl, you got a vinyl on here, $25. But you've got the lambskin on here, 79. That's a great deal. And it's a Bible believer that writes it, David Hoffman. You can get his Common Man's Reference Bible. And just begin to mark up your Bible. It looks similar to this on the inside. Plenty of room to write out your notes. So that's nine things to do with your Bible. One of them is mark up your Bible. So you're constantly forgetting things you've learned, but writing it down in your Bible is like having backup brain storage. You always got it backed up. It's right there in your Bible. For example, say that I'm teaching Sunday school. I forgot my lesson at home. I forgot my, my papers for the lesson at home, but I got my Bible. I could turn to 2 Chronicles 30 
And I've got that wrote out about Hezekiah in there already from a previous lesson. I could teach on that lesson. Nobody had no idea that I forgot my notes. You're When you got a marked up Bible, it's marked up that good. You're always prepared to give something out to somebody. So mark up your Bible. Then the next thing, memorize and meditate on the scriptures. You can hide the word in you. In Psalm 119.11 it says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You want to memorize it. You want to put it in your heart. That way it's always stored up in there. Once again, you, you're you storing up the word of God in you. If you hide the word in you, then you can access it anywhere that you go. You, and you can memorize the scriptures by, I've told you about this before, by writing them down on index cards and carrying them around in your pocket at work. You know, you're spending all this time at work and while you're working, you're there for 8, 10, 11, 12 hours a day. Pull out those index cards, read four words off of it, uh, and then put it back in your pocket. And then recite those four words in your head over and over again. Put a small New Testament in the pocket where you usually keep your phone. And then pull that New Testament out. And instead of scrolling Facebook and TikTok, you can pull out that New Testament and memorize a verse while you're on break. Memorize and meditate. This will help you think on things that are holy. It said in Psalm 119, 148, Mine eyes prevent the night watches that I might meditate in thy word. And I put meditate and memorize together because I meditate on the words as I try to memorize them. And memorizing them is not the hard part. The hard part is retaining them. But even if you don't retain everything that you memorized, you still got that under you still got that that understanding that you got while you were memorizing it that it just sticks with you. And if you're walking around meditating on the word, it's like talking to God on the phone and letting God talk letting him talk back to you, letting him do all the talking. You're just soaking it all in. And this keeps your thought life pure. In Philippians 4, 8, it says, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Well, if you're meditating and memorizing on the scriptures, you're thinking on those things. Now, the next thing is, befriend the Bible. The Bible is there for you. And Proverbs 18, 24 says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. And there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. The Lord sticks closer than a brother. And he comforts you through the word. You need to be a friend back to the scriptures and so you show yourself friendly to the scriptures. I mean, think about your best friend. You like to hang out with your friend, right? You should want to spend time with the Bible. You know how you'll just sit and listen to your friend talking? Get an audio Bible and just sit and listen to God talk through a voice. And just spend time in fellowship with God that way. If you're a friend to the Bible, then when someone shows you a supposed contradiction in the Bible, then your first thought should be Romans 3, 4, which says that God be true, but every man a liar. You give the Bible the benefit of the doubt because it's your friend. You see, a lot of people won't go anywhere unless they have a friend with them. Take your Bible to work. Take your Bible to school. Take your Bible to the doctor. He goes where you go. You're inseparable. If they see you, they know what well, he's going to be with the Bible, just like you are with your best friend. If you befriend the Bible and someone approaches you claiming the Bible has er errors, this leads you to another thing you can do with the Bible and that is defend the Bible. In Jude verse 3 it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So you want to contend for the faith. Fight a good fight. Fighting is good, just not among Bible believers. 
But contention, contention is good if you're contending for the right thing. When someone says your friend, your word of God is a liar, that it's full of errors and contradictions or that it's not true, then you need to stand up in the Bible's defense. If the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is perfect, he's perfect, he's sinless, he's without error, he's got no uncleanness in him, he's without blemish and without spot, if he's without error, wouldn't it make sense that the written word is also perfect? If the living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, is perfect, wouldn't it make sense that the written word is also perfect? Think about it. And do you know what the Pharisees would sit around all day and try to do? In Matthew twenty-two fifteen, it says, Then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. They were going around trying to trip the Lord up and entangle him in his talk. Look at Luke eleven fifty three fifty four. 54. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak many things, laying wait for him and seeking to catch something out of his mouth that they might accuse him. See that? What do they do? Now what do they do? What do they sit around and try to do? Find faults in the written word. Just like when the Lord was walking and talking on earth, they was trying to find fault in the living word. But you want to defend the Bible. Because you've befriended the Bible, you've spent all this time studying the scriptures, you've spent all this time reading the scriptures, you've spent all this time believing the scriptures, and now you're going to defend them. Now you're going to befriend them. And now you're going to apply them. Let the Bible transform your mind and how you live. In James 1, through 25, it says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whoso looketh unto the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. See, you, you, you don't want to just be a hearer of the word. You know, you can spend all this time studying the Bible, reading the Bible, memorizing the Bible, but you also want to be a doer of it, not just a hearer of it. You want to let the Bible transform your life and your mind. And if you're not doing that, then you're just soaking up a bunch of knowledge that's, you know, just sitting in your mind, not doing anything. But if, see, if you just study and read and memorize it, never put it into practice, you're going to get puffed up in your knowledge. You need to do what it says, rightly dividing it, of course, and be an open Bible. Be a walking, talking Bible. Don't let your knowledge puff you up. Let the Word of God that you're putting in all day come out of your mouth, and that's going to lead you to do the next thing. The next thing you can do with your Bible is hold forth the Bible. The last thing here, it says in Philippians 2.16, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Hold forth the word of life. It says in Psalm 60 and verse 4, Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of the truth. You see? Be a Bible for everyone to read yourself. Hold forth the word of life. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, 2, Ye are our epistle written in our hearts, known and read of all men. You are the only Bible that some people are ever going to read. The closest some people are going to get to the Bible is when you're reading it on break, when you're speaking it. And just like Peter said, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. Be a walking, talking Bible. And 1 Peter 3.15, it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. You want to be ready. You want to hold forth the Bible. You want to display the Bible everywhere you go. You don't just keep it to yourself. I mean, this is a, a gift from God, the Word of God. You want to show it to everybody. Hold forth the Bible. Apply the Bible. Defend the Bible. Befriend the Bible. 
Memorize and meditate on it. Mark it up. Study it. Read it. Believe it. And it's going to effectually work in you that believe. So that is nine things to do with your Bible. The outline is wrote down here on HensleyBibleBeliever.com. And you can come and read it. Take it and use it as your own if you want to. Pretend you wrote it. I don't care. You can take it. Make copies of it and sell it for all I care and keep the money. I, it doesn't make any difference to me. I just want to get people interested in the Bible. And the more you stay in the Bible, the more you're going to love it. The more you stay in the Bible, the more you're going to believe it. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And just stay in your Bibles. Do what you can do to stay in your Bible. And these aren't commandments. You don't have to do these things. It's just some suggestions I'm putting out there to get people to want to stay in their Bibles.